Hi, my name is Dr. Tracy. I am a practicing veterinarian. I want to give you a little background before I start here. I have been in the veterinary field for a very long time. I have been a technician since I was 15 to 24 years old. While I was a technician, I supported myself to go to vet school at the University of Minnesota. I graduated when I was 24 years old and practiced at a small animal practice from 2004 to 2014. Then I decided to branch out and become a home euthanasia and hospice vet, and I presently still run my own practice in Minnesota. Being in the niche of doing home euthanasia hospice for veterinarians, um, I am asked a lot of questions as far as when is it, is it time to consider euthanasia for my pet. And I am going to try to answer some of those questions and go over what I talk about with a lot of my clients, whether it be on the phone or when I am at their house. The first thing that we make essential for owners to try to evaluate is to try to evaluate their pet's overall quality of life. Basically, it's asking a lot of different questions to help them decide if their pet is comfortable and if their pet needs intervention or if it's time for euthanasia. One of the first questions I tend to ask is, is your pet in pain? Um, and can you tell if your pet's in pain? I like to let all of my clients know that not all pets tend to follow and read the books and every pet is very different. So you have to evaluate your pet individually versus trying to evaluate them versus what you read online because it may be different for your pet. So for quality of life scale, there are actual pages and or online resources that you can do to help calculate an actual score for your pet's quality of life. I like this one and there's also a really good one on journeyspet.com that helps calculate it out for you. I recommend that the entire family takes it if they're able to and then take the average score so you're getting kind of everybody's thoughts on it. Just because your pet has a low quality of life score doesn't mean it's immediately time for euthanasia. I recommend people take this when they're starting to question quality of life or after their pet has been diagnosed with a terminal disease and then continue to take it over time to see and help you evaluate when your pet's quality of life is diminishing. So evaluating pain in a dog and cat can sometimes be difficult. They are very stoic and a lot of times, especially in cats, they can really hide what they're feeling. So I recommend Googling or going directly onto the Colorado State University of Veterinary Medical Center and looking up their feline and, pain and canine pain scale and take a look at it. A lot of times it can give you some hints and pointers as to how your pet should look when they're healthy and happy and also kind of show you signs and things to look for when they seem like they're in pain. So here is a quick view of the Colorado Pain Scale for dogs as well. If you're starting to see dogs in one or two, especially into two, you need to start talking to your veterinarian about appropriate pain medications for your dog. Because if they're getting to two or to three and four category, they're already in a lot of pain and discomfort and their quality of life should be pretty poor at that point. If your pet's already on pain medications, then you need to spark a conversation with your vet as to what can be added or to start talking about quality of life and when to consider euthanasia. Another thing you can evaluate is to see if your pet's resting respiratory rate and heart rate are within the normal range. This is Gus. He is a young, spry little puppy. He's nice and relaxed right now, and as you can see, he's breathing in and out. A resting respiratory rate is how many breaths is he taking within a minute period. Honestly, it should be anywhere from 10 up to about 20 or 25, depending on the size of your dog. It gets a little faster if they're smaller, and it's slower if they're sleeping. You can also evaluate their heart rate. Now sometimes that's easier said than done. If you have a dog, you can place your hand underneath their arm and just kind of feel on their chest and count how many heartbeats are happening in a minute. The other option you can do is gently put your hand underneath their leg and just lightly palpate where their femoral pulse would be. If you're pressing too hard, you may not feel it. If you let up a little bit, you should feel it being nice and strong underneath your fingers. Count it for a minute and see what their resting heart rate is. Heart rates should be anywhere between 80 up until about 120 
for most dogs. Some dogs run a little higher, some are a little slower. I usually recommend checking it when they're healthy and just seeing what their normal respiratory and resting heart rate are. And then you'll be able to know when it's different as they get older and if there's diseases they're dealing with. Now for cats, you can do the same concept that I showed you with Gus on how to count the respiratory rate and feel their heart rate. Usually it's easier to feel their heart rate just on their chest versus doing the femoral pulses. Go a little slower. They tend to question handling that they're not used to. Um, so it is a good thing to kind of get them used to when they're getting a little older just to be pet like that. So you are able to check that. Their respiratory, resting respiratory rate is usually between 15 and 30. And their heart rate is usually anywhere between 130, 100. 40 up to 200. Now just because it's a little slower or a little quicker doesn't mean there's something wrong but it can maybe spark a conversation with your vet to let them know that this is happening and see if it is something that also changes over time. Other things I recommend to do, help determine your pet's quality of life are trying to pick their five favorite things that they like to do. Now, if you have a lab like Gus, eating can certainly be one of those things. If it's something a little more obvious um, like that that's starting to change, you might need to have a conversation with your vet a lot earlier. But if it's something more subtle, like you're noticing he's just not wanting to go out on walks or um, he's not playing with his favorite ball or he seems to be withdrawing from the family versus following them everywhere, especially when you're cooking in the kitchen. Um, stuff like that, that would be things to consider. For cats, it can be a little less obvious because they tend to be a little more withdrawn if they're not one of those really social dog-like cats. Um, so you want to take those, the subtle things a little more seriously, like they're not following their favorite spot in the sun. They're not able to get up to their favorite spot. Um, they're not scratching on their post anymore. They're not getting excited about catnip. Stuff like that would be a more, um, more, likely for you to want to spark that conversation with your vet that things are changing. For me personally, those five favorite things, when one to two of them start to change or disappear, I'm starting to have the conversation with either my clients or my family if it's one of my personal pets. Because when three to four of those favorite things start to disappear, a lot of times those pets are in much dire need than we need than we know, and they're feeling a lot sicker than they're letting on. By the time that fifth thing tends to disappear, a lot of times they're in an emergency situation, and then clients are struggling trying to find somebody to help them at the very last moments while their pet is suffering. Now some animals do some really specific things that show that their quality of life is changing. I commonly hear cat owners tell me that their cats are hiding in odd spots that they never hide in, like the basement or behind a couch or in the bathroom. I also have a lot of cat owners at the end of life for their cat telling me that they're going and just sitting and staring at the water dish. Or if they're indoor outdoor kitties, they're tending to find bodies of water and just sitting there and staring. Now I have no clue why they do that, but I have a lot of people tell me that end stage um, dying process, that's what their pets are doing. For dogs, sometimes it can just be something as simple as being more or withdrawn or not wanting to play or not being as interested in food. But again, sometimes you have to take those really odd behaviors um, more into consideration too when you're determining the quality of life. I also tend to tell my clients to buy a cheap calendar at the dollar store and mark good days versus bad. G for good, B for bad at the end of the day. Now certainly you can use one of those quality of life scale calculators day by day to help you determine, hey, was this a bad day or a good day? Um, otherwise, usually I'll tell people just talk about it with your family at the end of the day or just sit down and kind of think back to how the day went. Did your pet eat all their meals? Can your pet get outside or did they soil themselves? Themselves. Did you have to assist them and carry them out every single time or were they able to get up and do it on their own? A lot of times when we're looking at our pets and living with them every single day, those changes and those good and bad days kind of all blur together. So it's really hard to know, did this month change and my dog is having more bad days than good? Or was this a really good month and my cat's having a really good, a good time and more, we're having more good days than bad? So just putting a G for good and B for bad at the end of each day for the calendar can help you look back each week, each month, kind of depending on how your pet is doing to help you determine if they're having overall more good days than bad. If we're starting to see more bad days than good, again, that should spark another conversation with your vet or a, a home euthanasia and hospice consultation. 
So those are some of the common things that I tend to talk about with my clients, um, usually being over the phone or even if we're having a pre-euthanasia consultation in their home, some things to evaluate. I hope it helps you, um, but there is a disclaimer. Being that I am a vet, I cannot prescribe or give you any recommendations for your pet um, without having a personal relationship and physical exam with your pet, um, but I can help you to just determine what conversations that you should spark with your vet because the more knowledge you have going into that conversation with your veterinarian the more you're going to get out of that appointment and the more they appreciate um, helping you because they know that you're more prepared for this as well. I will be posting more videos down the road um, discussing some of the terminal diseases that I see, whether it be cancers or certain diseases like diabetes, congestive heart failure, etc., cetera, um, just to kind of help you determine when your pet is not doing well and also kind of determining or letting you know other conversations you can have with your vet, vet to help support your pet. Um, feel free if you need to in the comment section, you can ask about certain um, diseases or anything you'd like me to go over that's in stage life um, and I will try to um, send out a post as quick as I can to help answer those questions for for everybody that needs them.